My name is Adrian Danchev, and this channel is all about helping you become a remarkable entrepreneur. So that's why I started this podcast, to bring you people from all over the world, whether entrepreneurs or not, to share with you their story, their journey, who they are, and why they're doing what they're doing. Today I have with me Brennan Hodge, all the way from the States, to talk about, at the very least, healthcare. So please, Brennan, tell the world, explain to the world, who are you? And why are you doing what you're doing? Hi, Adrian. Well, uh, first of all, thanks for having me on here. I appreciate it. And um, my name is Brennan Hodge. I am a, a tech entrepreneur. I have been for the most of my adult life since about 2009. I actually started uh, the entrepreneur path. Uh, my background was really in, in biology and chemistry. And I had a passion for science and how the human body works and also technology. So I was going into medical school in 2008, 2009, realized that healthcare in our country was broken and it was not getting any better. So I realized that my best case, the best use of my skills would be to go in business and fix it from the business side of it. Figured I had more of an impact that way. Uh, so I started in 2009, I actually went back to grad school for business and started, like I said, the entrepreneur journey. Started a uh, web development and marketing company, uh, software development firm, rolling out some applications. And then we got into a pharmaceutical software project. And um, I'll spend a little time talking here. Uh, it's called Far Media. As a matter of fact, we're still running. We're trying to sell it now. But this really opened my eyes to how bad our healthcare system was, and namely the health insurance system. And when I saw the problems happening in that, I realized that I no longer wanted to enable these, these entities to game the system, so to speak, um, to really bill insurances for astronomical amounts. I realized that I actually want to use my limited time here on Earth to fix this problem and actually to make it better for everybody. Um, so, yeah, I'm doing what I'm doing now with uh, Citizen Health to create a better – it's a better life for everybody because you start looking at healthcare. I mean, if you don't have your health, what do you have? I mean, really, we take our health for granted. And one thing that I see it in in America here is we, as as Americans, are we're actually taken advantage of by corporations. I know single payer system is different, uh, but here we have these for profit health insurance companies that you know, by definition, by their business model, it is to take as much money as they can from us in the form of monthly premiums and pay out doctors as little as possible. I mean, that is their business model and it's causing tons of problems. So when I saw this, I realized it was time to, to fix it. But let me get back to what I was saying on Farm Media. And this is really what opened my eyes. Uh, I had a bird's eye view of about 60 pharmacies across the states and these pharmacies were selling products to doctors, um, transdermal pain medications, metabolic formulas. Uh, and I had the, uh, the ability to see the cost of these ingredients. And I, you know, I had a, I sat on conference calls where they sourced these ingredients from China. And it was kind of that situation where like, I, I know somebody in the embassy over there, they can get the stuff across the border. It was really sketchy stuff, really sketchy stuff. And they were selling these prescriptions, a 30 day prescription, 30 day supply, uh, for instance, $25,000 they were billing insurance for. It would cost them $100 for the ingredients. So, I mean, that's an astronomical profit margin there. And they were, the doctors were writing this for a 90-day supply. So, every 30 days, they're shipping out. They actually ship it out. It's mail order. Uh, ship out new prescriptions to these patients. Uh, and they have pharmaceutical sales reps that actually facilitate this. They go out to doctors and sell the products. Well, I watched one sales rep, a pharmaceutical sales rep, make $500,000 a day in commission. Uh, this sales rep made about $23 million in the course of about two and a half months. Uh, that was on the high end, but there were numerous sales reps making between $100,000 to $300,000 a day in commission. And this money, that these pharmacies are billing the insurance companies. So the insurance companies the following year realize that, hey, we're paying out a lot of money. We have to up our premium prices, up our policy prices, which causes it's a downward spiral because every, you know, every person in America actually has to pay more the next year. So when I saw all this happening, uh, I kind of knew some fraud was happening. And 
it wasn't just me. It was also the FBI <laughs> knew fraud was happening. Uh, and they raided a bunch of pharmacies, uh, you know, came in there with SWAT team, shut them down. And uh, there, that was, that was in 2016, in January of 2016. And around that time is when I realized that, whoa, whoa, I got to fix this. So actually I took the next, uh, the rest of 2016, uh, took that time to research healthcare and researched every single touch point in healthcare. I'm talking about for 16 hours a day, every single day I came to work, uh, read books, listened to podcasts, listened to audio books, uh, did extensive research on healthcare. You know, I already knew a lot, but I was getting into the nuts and bolts of how everything worked. And when you start getting into pharmacy benefit managers and, and their parts to play and all the really the intermediaries that are taking a cut of, of the healthcare dollars that the American people pay, you clearly start to see some trends and really you see some problems. And I did a lot of math, a lot, a lot of spreadsheets to really uh, highlight the problems and, and where the problem areas are. And from every root cause analysis I've done, my general conclusion was that the health insurance companies were the problem. They were the, they're the middlemen. They're the people that actually take our money and pay claims out. And from my estimations, we pay in 2015, that was about the last time I can get some accurate numbers, the American people, we have 325 million Americans here. We got about 150 million people that are under an employer based plan. So they get their health insurance th uh, through an employer. And generally it's about a, a 50, 50 split where the employer pays 50%, the patient or the uh, employee pays 50%. Sometimes that could be different. Seven, 70, 30. Well, anyways, the premiums alone that we pay, that I pay, that my, everybody else paid came to be about $1.2 trillion for the year. And that's not out of pocket. That's not the co-pays and that is not even accounting the taxes that are withheld out of our paychecks for Medicaid and Medicare. You add all that up and it comes out to be $2.3 trillion. So that's how much leave the bank accounts of American people, of hardworking American people and go to these for-profit health insurance companies. Okay. That's a problem right there because then I started looking at every single procedure that was performed in 2015. And this took me a long time to figure out, but uh, generally I went with about the, the, the most common procedures, it was the top hundred common procedures. Um, other stuff really, you know, factor in about another 10 or 20 billion, but going with cash prices. And there's a few websites where you can go and say, um, you know, you're getting your knee scoped or, um, you know, getting your hip replaced. You can actually pay cash with that. You don't have to have insurance to cover that. Now, if you look at the cash price for these, these surgeries as a whole, everything for every man, woman, and child came up to be about $900 billion. Now, we're talking about big numbers, but just in premiums, we pay $1.2 trillion. And then the cash price of everything performed was $900 billion. So right then, we already pay enough in premiums to cover every man, woman, and child of every single procedure done. And most of those procedures aren't even needed. That's another point. But what I'm getting at is you clearly see that we are not really maximizing the use of our dollar. We're sending it to people that are needless intermediaries, the insurance companies, the brokers, the third party administrators. There's all these people that are just taking a two or 3% cut out of the, out of the dollar that goes through and you get to the doctor over here and he doesn't get very much. And you know, when I saw this problem happen, I realized that the American people, are the largest single payer of healthcare. It's not the government. It's not a corporation. It's not an insurance company. It's the American people. So we actually pay enough to cover everybody. So then I realized uh, I've been big in the crowdfunding since you know 2010. I actually had the idea of crowdfunding health insurance, like just how to do that. And and then I started realizing that you know we have the power. We already have the money, and we also have the power to to fund a new healthcare system. So I started. Uh, generating this idea, um, kind of the data proved to me that this was possible and when I, from the research I did in 2016. But when blockchain technology comes out, came out, and I've been following Bitcoin from since it was two pennies. I got a good story on this. I know we don't need to get lengthy on this, but uh, when Bitcoin was two cents, I tried to buy $500 worth. I'm still kicking myself for that. But it was kind of a sketchy process. I had to send money to some guy via Western Union. And I just didn't really, I wasn't feeling it then. And I was actually in grad school and I was day trading at the time. 
I had a big project due and I was actually mining some uh, mining Bitcoin for a couple of days and it was slowing my computer down. So I decided to, to kill that. I probably did mine some Bitcoin. I can't really recall. My dad threw that computer away, but that's another story. So I've been following cryptocurrencies and Bitcoin since then. And I've been following Ethereum, uh, especially right when it launched and the, the capability of smart contracts. And when I saw the capabilities of smart contracts, I realized, hmm, there's something there. Because you start thinking about what a uh, insurance policy is, what an insurance contract is. It is a, it's a contract full of if this, then that statements. So saying if X happens, Y is going to get paid this amount. You know, it's just a, something that can be codified. And that is perfect for smart contracts. You put money into a smart contract. When something happens, that contract is executed, that, uh, that agent gets paid. Then I started kind of digging into that. And then all these the crowd sales and token sales, ICOs have been happening. I don't know if uh, you've been paying attention to that. But then I, that kind of you know, brought together my idea of crowdfunding health insurance, of you know, giving back the, the power to the people and the patients, and having a way to fund all this. And, you know, once I saw this come together, I realized it was a perfect opportunity to launch Citizen Health. And that is where I'm at now, Citizen Health. And I'll kind of dig down to that a little bit. Uh, this is a, it's a decentralized health economy is what we're calling it. Um, I don't like centralized anything. I think greed gets in the way of these profit centralized intermediaries. And I think that the uh, blockchain technology is going to enable a, a much better world than we can't even comprehend right now. I mean, there's so many opportunities um, that, that are going to be enabled from this technology uh, alongside AI and robotics. But what we have going on here is we're creating a nonprofit organization that is owned and operated by the people, you and I, um, the providers. It's really the patients and the providers come together and get to uh, vote on, to propose and discuss um, how this health economy is going to be run. And also the money that we already pay in terms of premiums will fund this. Uh, there will be no government interference. I mean, of course, there's going to be some regulation, but this is generally a free market system. Uh, there are some bills already passed in about 21 states <coughs> that are favorable to this model, which I'm about to explain. And there are no corporations involved with this. So there is no for-profit motivations uh, that will really cause the problem that's been causing. And the regulations I was talking about is direct primary care. Now, this is really cool. Uh, direct primary care has been, it's like concierge medicine. It's been coming on pretty strong over the past four or five years. And that is essentially a subscription to healthcare. So you find your primary care doctor, your pediatrician, your family practitioner, and you pay him or her 75 bucks a month and you can get unlimited visits. You might, you might be really sick and you have to go once a week um, or you might not go at all. You're still paying 75 bucks a month. It's like Netflix. You know, you're going to pay that 9.99 a month, whether you watch 20 videos or 20 movies or none. Uh, also, you know, under this direct primary care or direct care contract under those 21 or so States, it does not fall under insurance regulation. So, it kind of opens the, the, a new world up to these doctors that can uh, ditch their old EMRs and they're not accepting insurance one. They're not accepting insurance at all because they hate insurance and uh, they're just accepting cash payments on a subscription basis. And these doctors absolutely love their life now. I mean, you can ask any doctor is practicing uh, DPC and they're gaining that time back. You know, previously with a, a primary care doctor, they would have, uh, on average, about, I don't know, 2,000, 2,500 patients a year. And that, that equates to seeing your patients for about seven to 10 minutes. And you, generally, you're sitting there typing on a computer, working on the, the EMR, and you're not even really having face-to-face -face time with the patient. You just give them a medication. They're on their way. Really don't get to the root cause of the problem. You just kind of patch it up. And they come back in the next month, the same thing. And the next month, the same thing. It's, it's called reactive medicine, that model there. And I'll, I'll kind of get in that minute. But anyways, this direct primary care model. We're capitalizing off that because the doctors are ditching insurances already. The patients know that they're spending an astronomical amount on insurances. They hate it. So they're going to this subscription based model that's saving everybody a lot of money. And employers are going to this model too, because it's also saving them money. And 
we are creating a nationwide network of, of physicians and nurse practitioners and physicians assistants that want to further this model. Uh, it's not necessarily uh, necessarily a franchise model, but it is a um, just kind of a, a network, uh, so to speak. And these doctors will completely not accept insurances. They will accept our new cryptocurrency, which I'll get into here in a minute. And they will build this system however they see fit. We're actually going to crowdsource a new EMR, and that stands for um, Electronic Medical Records. EMR, EHR, we need to change that name because it's all electronic. But the idea behind having a, a better technology in place, see, once you remove insurance, once you remove health insurance from the equation, then we can start developing better software that actually acts as a tool to help physicians and help the patients. I mean, for example, let me see it. You can see this. This is a got Alexa over here. I got Google Home over here. I got Cortana sitting over there on my computer. Uh, the point is I have technology that listens to me all the time. Uh, doctors, hang on, I got somebody beeping in. Doctors sit there and they have to type and click and check boxes and do monotonous tasks for every single patient. We have the technology and we're going to have the technology. It keeps getting better and better. Uh, to basically just be a voice interface, you know, just where that doctor can sit down and have a face to face with the patient and have their voice and everything they're saying being automatically dictated, automatically recorded uh, by this artificial intelligence uh, health nurse, health bot, or whatever you want to call it. We're calling it a health intelligence. And also with computer vision, I mean, you can see the patient, you have these diagnostics. You really don't need all the, the manual processes of, of today. Um, in the future. So we're really completely reinventing healthcare from the ground up. And that is going to be our first use case is the actual direct primary care doctors. Uh, like I said, we're re completely reinventing this uh, using first principles thinking. And this is how I've always thought until I actually found a name for it. But um, Elon Musk is famous for, for saying that a lot. But if you really look at the root, see, I treat first principles thinking as getting down to the root of it. Like I look at everything, every big problem as a almost a three dimensional chess game where you have all these pieces in there and there's so many different interactions. But if you strip away all the excess and strip away the things that aren't really important, you get down to that, that fundamental truth, that fundamental question of what we're trying to answer and then start building and constructing from that fundamental question. Uh, and you can, you can build something entirely different than what we currently have. And that question I asked myself was, you know, what are we trying to do as, as a species, you know, as a, uh, for one in America right now, what are we trying to do as a healthcare industry? Are we trying to create an environment that profits from people's misfortunes, their health, unhealthy misfortunes, or are we trying to create a system to, to utilize our technology to create a system that keeps people healthy? Like that, that is a decision tree, a fork in the road. Either we can continue down this reactive model of healthcare, which is, you know, going in there, writing a prescription, patch the person up, send them out the door in seven minutes, or start utilizing our technology, um, you know, nanotechnology, genomics, uh, behavioral economics, and really start focusing on the patient as a person and keeping that patient or that person healthy before they even become a patient. So the whole idea is for citizen health is to keep that person healthy and out of the hospital. I mean, problem solved that happens. You save trillions of dollars, the patient or the person is actually healthy and they get to live a better life. The economic output is better. I mean, think about it. Just as far as the economy goes as a whole, you have unhealthy people. They're taking time off of work. Uh, economic output goes down for all those employers. Now you got healthy people. They're happy. Their brain works better. They're interacting better with their employees. Their employer gets to make more money. It's just a perfect world after that happens. So that's kind of the idea. That's the, the decision tree we're going down is that proactive side. So everything we're doing is, is with the mindset of how our healthcare system is going to be in 30 years. And I'll tell you kind of a personal story. I'm, I have about a 16 month old right now. And when I brought him home from the hospital, uh, he's a few days old. I'm sitting there thinking, you know, what's your life going to be like in, in 30 years when you're my age, you know, and, uh, 
at the time, I'm, I'm kind of a self-proclaimed futurist. I never really called myself that, but I, I study a lot of future technologies and exponential technologies. And I always like to make my own predictions of how, how the future is going to look. And over the past 10 years, I've made some pretty good predictions that have come true. Nothing public, though. Maybe I need to start doing that. But I started thinking about you know, just, you know, 30 years from now, what's the world going to look like? And I started thinking about healthcare, and I, and I started thinking that, you know, if we continue down this path, it's going to be absolutely terrible if we continue to do the same things we're doing. And then I kind of made it a personal mission of mine. I mean, this is all about right when Citizen Health got started, that I was uh, going to dedicate the next 30 years of my life to making that happen. Um, because, you know, you got multiple different types of entrepreneurs. Some people, you know, have different uh, risk tolerances. And I built a few companies that were some failures, some semi-successes, but I see how fast five years can go by. And the company that I previously built, it just, you know, I didn't have that long-term vision for it, but now I have a vision for 10 years out, 20 years out, 30 years out. I really want to create this to be that, that economy and that ecosystem that I can, I can see for my son and for our kids, our offspring and our, you know, Heck, when I get 60 or 70 years old, I'm going to want something like this to take care of me. And uh, so I'm taking that mindset into building this. I'm, I'm not in this for the money at all. Uh, of course, we're building a whole new economy that's uh, based off of multiple cryptocurrencies. So, yeah, the money is going to be there. But the profit motive is nowhere to be seen. Like, I'm not against capitalism. Capitalism is a great financial uh, uh, instrument to really got us to where we, we are now. I mean, it built the world we're living in, but I think capitalism <clears throat> has almost reached a tipping point where it's starting to erode. Uh, you really got greed that kind of gets in the way and it's starting to erode it like a cancer. And I'm seeing it happen and a lot of people are happening. I mean, there's just, there's a lot of fraud. There's a lot of cheating. There's a lot of lying going on in big corporations. And I think the future is going to be a whole lot different than we see it now, especially with, with the, the sharing economy coming on strong, with uh, the promise of blockchain technology and peer-to-peer -peer transactions, uh, it's really some cool stuff. And um, I'm kind of really going off tangent here. Is, is there anything you want to ask? And well, you covered, a, you covered a lot of things there, a <laughs> lot of things. So, um, yeah, first of all, Bitcoin, I can remember when that was around $200 back in late 2014 November, around, you know, around this time, November 2014. But back then, it was like, what is this? Is this a snake? Is it a snake oil salesman? Snake oil salesman, or what is this? Uh, there was no real, no real understanding of it. And blockchain, the concept of that, I didn't come across that until say March of 27, 20, just gone 2017. Yeah. So um, that was a little new to me. So uh, you mentioned decentralizing the health economy. You know, on the basis of a blockchain technology, out of curiosity, because you mentioned the phrase decentralizing it, what are your thoughts on, say, other healthcare systems in the world, like we have here in the UK with the National Health Service, NHS, where the government, it's in the taxes and the government provides it. What's your mm -hmm. thoughts on that you know, in, in sure. terms of decentralized? Yeah, uh, you know, there are definitely uh, good points about that. Um, there are good points and bad points. Matter of fact, our um, I guess you'd call them our CTO or our, we're really not operating under titles, but our lead developer and lead blockchain architect, he's from the UK and we have conversations all the time on, on this. Now I've had other conversations with people from um, all over, um, all over the country about their healthcare systems and a single payer or government payer system. It is, it's good to a certain extent and correct me if I'm wrong. It's good for your minor things. It's good for your everyday occurrences. You go to the doctor, you have a cold, you get the flu, stuff like that. But when you really get down to uh, serious surgeries, it's not the best system. And I've been told that from multiple people, but in terms of having an intermediary, you're still having that intermediary. It's still centralized. You're still kind of beholden to the government to, for them to really, I'm not going to say steal your money away from you, but demand that you pay them to facilitate your health care. I mean, you're still having a, it's just like an insurance company. They're acting in the same manner. So I like the idea of people not going broke and not having to file for bankruptcy to have their health care provided because, oh my gosh, I saw a stat the other day, 643,000 Americans file for bankruptcy due to medical bills. Like, 
what? <laughs> 60% of all bankruptcies in, in America are because of medical bills. One, UK, uh, Sweden, all places over there, zero. Who files for bankruptcy? So we have a serious problem with that. I mean, once you file for bankruptcy, your credit's messed up. You know, you're kind of going on a downhill path after that for a few years. But in terms of having a government pay for your health care, you know, I like it. It's, it is the best solution that up until this point, I think there, there is, having the government be that single payer. Uh, I'm not against it, but I am against it now because I do think that blockchain technology coming out, it provides a better opportunity to create something brand new. And for instance, if we blew up everything, like every healthcare system in the world right now, and we brought the smartest people together and said, hey, let's start right now with the technologies that we have right now and the technologies that we're going to be having in the next five to 10 years. And let's build that. Let's come up with a better solution. Um, I'm pretty sure that even a uh, government run healthcare system would not be a thing. Um, so what are your, what are your thoughts on your healthcare system over there? I'm curious. Well, I, I think that in terms of a government funded one in, in, in the small, in minor things, yes. But on the grand things, not so much. The allocation isn't, isn't there. The, the proper distribution isn't there. The proper motive isn't there. It's it, a bit sloppy. I saw an article briefly recently talking about how these gloves, these rubber gloves that cost something like 35 pence are being bought for something like 35 pounds. And there's a quote by one of the health ministers saying that NHS is one of the most efficient in the world. So it's like, I can see that drawback in terms of the government side, but at the same time, um, my limited experience and exposure with the private medical sector is it's, it's a little over expensive, maybe, maybe a little cheeky at times where it caught, you, you, know, you pay a little extra for every night you want to stay there or you need this extra surge, uh, this extra operation and it costs extra and it's just, there's, up, there's upsells and upsells and cross-sells cross -sell, cross upon cross-sells. So I've not had too much experience with it or exposure with it, but that's my general consensus of it. But from a handy side, just like not having to worry about it, ease of mind, so to speak, that's why I prefer it ever so slightly than the American system, albeit I don't fully, I, I personally don't fully understand the American system. I think there's the institutions, which is the hospitals, and you know, they're, run, they're run by uh, doctors or the MDs, and the same with the dentists, and, uh, chiropractors and beyond. And they're funded by, or they're paid for, you know, the middlemen, the corporations, uh, and they take uh, the premiums or the monthly fees from, say, uh, the potential patients, just how car insurance, there's the payers, the drive, the car, the roads, and you know, the, the authority, so to speak, on the road. I think it's that kind of system and structure. Um, but at the same time, though, one thing I have noticed with the NHS, it, and this is my, my, this was a double-bladed sword insofar as expansion of government, where the government can say, okay, we're, you know, we're going to give you health service, pay a little extra taxes, a little extra, they give you something with one hand, they're going to take away something else with another. So they're going to say, here's free health care, but ah, 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 we're going to have to raise taxes on these foods or that or too much calories or too many sugary drinks or stuff like that. Cause it's costing the NHS billions and billions. So we're going to give you this, but we're going to uh, you know, charge or put a tax on this to deter you from consuming that stuff in the attempt that it will save us money over here. Well, it's like you, if you get rid of these taxes over here, and reduce the complexity or the budget or whatever over here, streamline it, I'm not sure what the word you could say, then we can have both the basic healthcare without these excess uh, taxes that increase standard or decrease standard living, and then we can fund our own uh, medical care. Yeah, that's uh, yeah, that's about what I gather from the NHS and also from over here. Uh, it's, it's closely the same what you were hitting on. I know that we have over 600 different health insurance companies. That's a lot. And so and we pay our, our money, you know, in forms of monthly premiums to these for-profit health insurance companies. And they in turn, you know, pay out claims or reject claims to these numerous doctors and health systems. And there is just so much um, inefficiencies in this market. Uh, I mean, I just go on down a list, but I'm really not trying to talk about the, the problems in healthcare, but it's, it's absolutely terrible. I mean, it's estimated that we waste $900 billion 
a year and just unnecessary uh, procedures. That's like $300 billion in fraud. And get this, by the lowest estimation, 250,000 people die each year from medical errors in America. Like a quarter of a million people die from medical errors. And this could be anywhere from um, getting an infection in surgery, giving the wrong medication to somebody, uh, some just chopping off the wrong leg or missing the tumor they're supposed to cut, cut out. I mean, a bunch of random things. I mean, that's 250,000 people. And we're not, doing, we're not doing anything about that. I mean, that is the third largest killer of Americans behind cancer and heart attacks. And we're not doing anything about it. And I firmly believe that we have the technology to uh, pretty much eliminate all those medical errors. Uh, we have AI, we have, you know, uh, natural language processing that actually just pick up on every single thing we're saying, document everything. I mean, my, my wife's a labor and delivery nurse and she tells me these things all the time. I'm just like, are we still operating in 1980? Because it sounds pretty terrible. Um, so yeah, I mean, we have a, a broken healthcare system and it really is broken all over the world. Because the NHS, from what I've been gathering from our news sources over here, it's not doing great. I mean, the costs are going up. You know, they're actually they limited surgeries on people that uh, were obese or smoked, right, the other day. I mean, these are situations. It's not just for the NHS or America. I mean, I talk to – every time I get an Uber, I like to talk to people because uh, generally from you know, all over the place. And I just get their feedback on their different country system and – Every place is broken. I've never talked to one person that absolutely loved their healthcare system. It's just they're not getting what they pay for because there are middlemen in the middle of taking a cut. You remove those middlemen and then you save a lot of money. And you actually give power back to the people and give a voice back to people. That's what I want. I want to have a voice. Like if I see people, um, if I see something that I don't like, whatever that may be, I want to be able to propose a change in that direction and say, hey, we should do it differently. And I want people to also say, yeah, that's a good idea. We should do it differently. And then we actually have a voting process, a, uh, you know, a, a democratic or a liquid democratic voting process. And we vote on it and we make the change. Uh, I mean, now we're kind of getting some politics that could be drastically made better by cryptocurrency or blockchain technology. And, you know, having that, um, that voice and then actually a, a voice that counts, a, a voice and a vote. I love everything about this uh, this new future that we're trying to build. I mean, it's uh, it's going to help a lot of people. And also, what I want to get on to is <laughs> kind of the bigger picture behind all this. And the idea, you know, with genomics coming on strong, I'm a firm believer in genetic testing everybody. Uh, the price is going down. It's inversely proportional to Moore's law. It's really getting cheap. You know, 10 years ago, I think the cost of sequence of genome was about um, $100 million. Well, now it is eh, about five to six hundred dollars to sequence a genome. Within five years, it's going to be dollars. You know, it's going to be basically free. So everybody, even every single child that's born, is going to have their genome analyzed. And therefore, like throughout life, every time we prescribe a medication, uh, we can know beforehand whether that this this person with this specific genetic makeup is going to respond uh, well to this drug or not. Um, for right now, it's estimated that 50% of all drugs prescribed don't even work uh, at best, at worst, actually kill the patient. Um, so now we have these genetic tests, these pharmacogenomic tests that can actually say, don't prescribe this to this patient because they will die. I mean, that's a pretty um, hardcore uh, statement there, but that is, that's a serious in the situation. And genetics can tell us a lot, but still we're like – probably only about 10% of what we know about our genome right now. I couple that with microbiomics, really the study of every single thing that goes on in our body. I'm really a firm believer in bacteria in our body plays a huge part in conjunction with our genome uh, to, to, to influence how we, uh, how healthy we are and actually how we react to stuff. And uh, also kind of just going on, the, oh, this is what I was getting at. <clears throat> now, once we do shift all these people over to the citizen health model and we actually start sequencing all these genomes and have all this data. The idea is also to build a collaboration engine and we actually have on our website, uh, citizenhealth.io, you can actually go and we have multiple uh, components in our ecosystem and this collaboration engine is something that I'm really passionate about because 
it's kind of like open innovation. It's where we have, we bring together the brightest minds all over the world and we try to solve the previously unsolvable problems. We're talking about like curing cancer, curing various diseases, really uh, open sourcing the drug discovery process and the disease discovery process. Because right now in America, I mean, we have these pharmaceutical companies and these, these bigger corporations. It's, it's a silo of information. They don't necessarily want to collaborate with other people because of the intellectual property laws and because they want to keep those, the intellectual property there so they can profit off of it. I'm not for that. You know, I want to open up everything, be 100% transparent, collaborate and let's solve these problems. Let's cure cancer. Let's take this data and actually analyze it and, and try to come up with cures for the diseases that kill us. I know some things can't be cured, but I mean, we can still manage some of it and treat it. So there's a, there's a lot of plans on this. Yeah, so uh, just just as we slowly wrap up, just a few quick questions. Then, sure. You mentioned this. I mean, I'm very curious. You mentioned the, the, um, the, the bacteria inside our body. Mm -hmm. You mentioned it's important. You also talked about earlier how uh, nutrients and being healthy and having healthy lifestyles is important. What kind of role does diet or general health and well-being play in this model, in what you're building? A huge, a huge part. Our first app, now the first app that, that people will interact with in Citizen Health is a incentive system. And it is where they join and connect a wearable of their choice. We're gonna start with Fitbit, you know, Apple Health Kit, um, Garmin devices, Samsung devices, and they can actually import their health data and we're gonna generate a health score, almost like a credit score. And that health score, it really doesn't matter how bad or how good it is. It really matters about your baseline. And then once you, say the next day, you start improving your health score, whether that is taking 10,000 steps a day, really just get up and start moving. Because I think that's a huge problem is people just, they're sitting in chairs like, like me. I sit in a chair all day and it really takes a toll on you. But uh, you know, just get up and start moving. Get the blood circulating. Just kind of be active. Get the heart rate up. And also, you know, we are going to pay people to be healthy in this incentive system with our cryptocurrency. I mean, this is really cool, and this is going to open up an opportunity for our future universal basic income. But paying people to be healthy is proven to work, and we are going to incentivize people um, with our cryptocurrency to do just that. So, you know, being active, hitting certain metrics such as lowering your blood pressure, um, getting an adequate amount of sleep at night, uh, your nutrition, actually counting your calories, you know, taking pictures of your food, um, various things, competing with your friends, going to the gym, checking in, you know, drinking a certain amount of water every day, you know, weighing yourself. I mean, we have so many different connected devices. I mean, I check my blood pressure every single day. I mean, I got a this, I got a pulse ox here. I mean, I got a really cool thing here by LiveCore is a portable EKG. I mean, how awesome is that? EKG reader right there. And all these things, all these, uh, you know, devices that can track our, the metrics, our healthy metrics every single day. And over the course of a year, and I started January 1st and I have so much data on myself and I've been going, getting labs drawn and all of my diagnostic tests. And I can really start seeing a progression based on my diet, how my diet affects uh, me and how my sleep affects me. Whether I go to the gym every single morning, how that affects my productivity because I track all my, my productivity scores on my computer. And, you know, all of this in conjunction, you know, with a healthy diet and um, getting the right sleep, all this factors into your health score, which is kind of like center to what we're doing. We're trying to improve that health score, um, which is, is really, that is a cool um, process right there. Yeah, you mentioned some pretty cool stuff there. Um, sit down, sat, being sat down all day. Yeah, that's, uh, I, I, I realize how important that is or how bad that is. Uh, I remember a statistic once saying that 30 minutes of being sat down, the blood flow to the legs decreases by 30 to 50 percent. And I think from there that could lead to lead to things like deep vein thrombosis. So mm -hmm. uh, a big incentive to get moving, like standing up, or every 20 minutes or something like that. Or every every 20 minutes you're sat down, you should you should do something for five or so minutes. So um, one thing I tried to get into habit was every 20 or half an hour or one hour just do uh, 10 laps up and down the stairs mm -hmm. to get moving, just to get some resistance or some action going, some pumping. And um, also, you reminded me, I recently got a copper jug for water 
So putting all the water inside the copper jug and to do the frequency or the vibrations of the copper element itself purifies the water naturally. And it's like, well, it's a lot more clean, a lot more hygienic than a lot of other stuff that's already out there. So that's pretty cool. And um, EKG, could you just remind me, please, what is that exactly? Yeah, it's a, a live core, a live COR is the name of this company. And it's an um, electrocardiogram. I believe that's what it stands for. Yeah. And then actually, you just hold it here just like this. So you can get the, um, the frequencies of your heartbeat. Oh. And, and check that out. And say, for instance, if you did just have open heart surgery or you're having some um, heart problems, you can actually take your EKG and send it to a cardiologist, send it to your cardiologist and actually get a reading right then and there. You might be feeling woozy, getting a little dizzy or something, and you kind of think something might be off. Get a reading, send it to a cardiologist and says, hey, yeah, you know, go to the ER. You're about to have a heart attack or something similar to that. I mean, this, this could save – Plenty of lives, I'm sure he has. I don't have any stats on that, but an amazing device. It's not the device where you can you, you touch it and then it can. I don't know how through the electrical signals of the body you can tell how many how much vitamin K or vitamin A there is in the body or what you're deficit in or things like that. No, it's not that. And I know what you're talking about. I'm not sure that that's is. A, that's a rod you hold. I remember now, like a rod. Yeah, I'm not sure that is a that is for real. <laughs> Because actually, I went down that road doing a lot of research. I don't think that's entirely accurate. Well, I, I didn't believe it either, but I, I saw yeah. it once. I didn't get a chance to get examined, but I, I do remember someone doing it and they saying, oh, you're lacking vitamin K and that's good for the back, for the spine. And that's like, oh, yeah. it could be interesting. But at the same time, it could just be the furore effect saying, oh, you need this. Oh, yeah, okay, I need that, obviously. <laughs> so I don't really right. know. Um, but other thing I'm very curious about is what if someone – doesn't go for the full package with health, with citizen, citizen health, or what if they opt out and they choose to pay with Bitcoin, for example, or with cash at the hospital or the MD or elsewhere? How do you work around that? Well, we're actually focusing on, you know, we're not going to go after at single people. We're actually going after employers to begin with. Um, we're creating a captive model. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with captive insurances, uh, but this is a, a right for disruption for smart contracts. Uh, captives are where a group of employers that self-fund, um, you know, with say 50 or 100 employees, they actually join forces with 50 other, you know, 50 like-minded um, organizations, uh, companies, and they pool their money together, essentially. And they just pay claims out accordingly. And that's perfect for smart contracts. I mean, you put money in there, you know, you pay out claims, you reduce the intermediary. Uh, I had a conversation, a team meeting yesterday. We have a, a guy on our team that he's a, a benefits broker and that whole industry is going to be replaced. And he's fully aware of it because it, it's, it's an unnecessary manual process. So anyways, getting to your question is if people do want to pay with cash, well, it's kind of, starting from the very top, you know, if they're getting their, their insurance or their health, their health assurance, what we're going to call it, but they're getting that through the employer. It's kind of withheld out of their paychecks. So they never see it. It's not an actual payment process. It's just withheld out of their paychecks and the employer actually pays it to the insurance company today. They'll just pay it to us and we actually convert that into Medit or cryptocurrency. And, um, you know, from that, the patient just goes to the doctor and of course you're going to have a, uh, you know, a network of doctors and how it would work if that doctor is not in this network as part of this membership. Um, more than likely the patient can just go pay with cash and we can just contact the doctor and settle up after the fact. And that's how a lot of, um, what is called now is healthcare sharing ministries. And, you know, the idea behind citizen health is, is still, it's kind of somewhat being implemented by these healthcare and sharing ministries where it's people, um, uh, faith-based organiz faith organizations, they put their money together and they pay out claims accordingly. There's just no insurance. It's like a self-funded pool. And they do the same thing. Like if you go to a doctor that's not um, taking that particular insurance, uh, they'll just settle up after the fact. They just pay cash and then just go there and contact the doctor and pay them that way. So I don't really see that being a problem. Um, but the idea is to get everybody involved with this because it not only benefits the the patients or the people, it actually benefits the doctors because think of this as a team sport. You know, the person, the individual has a health score. Um, when that health score increases, 
the, the person actually gets is they generate more meta. So they generate more cryptocurrency that can be spent in our health and wellness marketplace, which, you know, you get discounts on food delivery services, gym memberships, athletic equipment, stuff like that. And the doctor, uh, he's also has skin in the game because that's his patient. You know, he is also trying to do the, his best job to keep that patient healthy and to increase their health score. So likewise, if that health score increases, the doctor is also incentivized or also uh, rewarded with more medit. So, I mean, there's multiple things that the, the patient and the provider can actually do to generate more of this currency. Um, you know, basically the doctor could uh, also be part of our development team to help train the artificial intelligence because it's going to take a lot of smart doctors to get this, this health intelligence uh, to function correctly. I mean, it's not just going to be a cut and dry, you know, two month process. We understand that. Um, but yeah, to, to answer your question, I don't really see that being a problem, <clears throat> but if it is with Bitcoin, I mean, there's like shapeshift right now, you can easily just convert from Bitcoin to any other cryptocurrency you want that they support with, you know, just like that. Yeah, that's, that, that's pretty cool. Sounds about right. And Brennan, as we slowly begin to wrap this podcast, what's next to you and what are you working on now? Okay. What's next for me? Well, yeah. right now we got about... So we got about that 12 people um, globally working on this project um, kind of part time, you know, just doing this, trying to put together this pro the whole project. And we're right now, we're actually developing our, our dual token system and uh, tokens. We're going to have a stable currency, which is absolutely huge in its own right, because you don't want to pay for healthcare services or anything with something that fluctuates as much as Bitcoin, because you're not going to want to pay when it goes down because you know it's going to go back up. So we're creating a stable currency and it's based off a few different models out there. Um, if you look at Hayek money or a uh, base coin right now, they actually have a pretty decent model. Um, we've actually been developing something very similar to that. And our second token is going to be more of a uh, function, almost like a bond type asset that works in conjunction with the Medit token that um, evens that out, that keeps that, that stable. So that's what we're working on now. And we're, we will be having a token sale. I know you hear ICO, it's not a coin per se, it's actually we're generating tokens. So we're gonna have a token generating event or a token sale in January. Uh, we have a few investors lined up and we're gonna be raising some, I have a private pre-sale um, end of November and December, then we're gonna roll into January and we're gonna hit it hot and heavy. I mean, we've been in stealth mode for the past year in terms of getting this going, and we're building out a, a team right now. So if anybody listening to this is, uh, you know, has passion on fixing healthcare and you know, really utilizing technology, then feel free to reach out and, and join us. Um, but that, that's what I'm doing right now. I'm kind of spreading the word a little bit now, getting that out. I have a few conferences lined up, and uh, we're gonna start building this. And this is gonna be one huge open source project. I don't know if I really mentioned that. So it's going to be open source from the start and uh, we're going to need a lot of collaborators and we already have a lot of interest on that side as far as the develop, development side goes. Um, but yeah, moving forward, it's uh, looking good. 2018 is going to be exciting. Yeah, that sounds pretty cool. And what's the best way for the audience to get in touch with you? Sure. Um, they can just go to our website, uh, citizenhealth.io and just uh, we have an email address, team at citizenhealth.io or they can email me directly, Brennan at citizenhealth.io. That's Brennan, B-R-E-N-N-E-N. -E and uh, other than that, you know, I'm on Twitter at Brennan Hodge. You can hit me up there, and um, yeah, you'll you'll get in contact me that way. Yeah, I'll include those links in the show notes below. Awesome. Yeah. So Brennan, it was great to have you on the show. Yeah. Great to be here. Thanks, Adrian. And ladies and gentlemen at home, if you haven't already, subscribe to the channel. Subscribe, click on the subscribe button below, press the bell notification right next to it. Subscribe, there's always a way. You see, because this channel is all about helping you become a remarkable entrepreneur. Because you see, that's what life is all about. To go out there into the world, plenty of opportunity, and do something remarkable. That is what life is all about. How cool is that's that? Right. That's yeah. right. Exactly.